it's really important to understand what a really slow, deliberative, robust version of good decision making looks like and to know how to apply that in order that when you're in a situation where you have to go very fast, it actually will improve your ability to do that uh, with high fidelity. Welcome to the Emergency Mind Podcast. I'm Dan Dworkis, and this is a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performance when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. All right, I am really, really excited about this episode. Our guest this episode is Annie Duke. Annie wields a deep expertise in decision-making, and specifically decision-making under conditions of uncertainty. She combines a theoretical knowledge of cognitive psychology with extensive practical knowledge from her former career as a professional poker player, where she won over four million in tournament poker before retiring from the game in 2012 to change focus towards understanding and teaching how we as humans can make better decisions. Her book, Thinking in Bets, was a national bestseller, and it absolutely changed how I personally practice emergency medicine. Her most recent book, How to Decide, Simple Tools for Making Better Choices, was released this month, that is October 2020, and is available everywhere. There's so much in this conversation that we have that it's hard to highlight even a couple of things, but we dig deeply into the incredible value of paying attention to things that are unexpected into looking for dispersion of opinions between members of a team, and ultimately on maximizing our ability to rapidly adjust our understanding of the universe in terms of how we make better decisions under pressure. Also, at one point, you get to hear me clumsily estimate the weight of a table that I can't see. Basically, it's a conversation that I plan on continuing to return to over and over again to sharpen my own skill at practicing under pressure. Before we get into it, two quick reminders. First, and most importantly, if you have ideas of things that you want the emergency mind to dig into, if you have ways that you perform under pressure, if you have questions about how the experts we talk to are able to deliver their knowledge in these circumstances, I would love to hear them. You can email me directly at dan at emergencymind.com. Second, if you like what you're hearing on the podcast, please share it widely and consider, if you're not already, signing up for our newsletter. It's called Knowledge Under Pressure. It's free, it's awesome, and it does a deep dive into some of the topics we cover on the podcast, as well as bringing together resources from a variety of fields about performance under pressure. You can find it at emergencymind.com slash sign up. Okay, all that said, let's get to it. I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. Annie, thank you so much for coming on this podcast. I, I'm incredibly happy to talk to you. As I was mentioning before we started recording, I'm a, an enormous fan, and I, I, like, I truly believe that your work has helped change the way that I practice emergency medicine and the way that I teach a lot of other people to practice emergency medicine. So, so thank you for being here. Well, I'm, I'm super excited, and I love when I get to talk to someone about how, how are they thinking about how to practically apply the ideas. And of course, Part of the reason I wrote how to decide was specifically to to help with translating some of the ideas that that sit in thinking and bets, but actually to offer a way uh, for people to start thinking about how how you could actually put these into pra- practical tools that would improve your decision process, regardless of whether you've read thinking or bets or not, which is certainly not a prerequisite to reading the new book, but they do speak to each other in that way. Yeah, and and I was lucky enough to get a bit of an advanced copy of it, and it's awesome and. Uh... I have a ton of notes that I'm going to be putting into practice in my own sort of medical practice as we go forward, a couple of which I tried out on some unsuspecting residents last (laughs) night. So very, (laughs) very exciting. Um, But I'm hoping we could start actually like back in time quite a bit. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm curious, as I've been reading all your work, like, what is the actual first decision that you remember making? Oh, my gosh. Okay, wait, I'm going to have to take a second with this. So, so the thing is, like, it depends on what I, I just need to, like, be clear about what the definition is. So, first of all, memory is kind of weird, as you know, and you don't really remember a lot of stuff from when you're little. So I know that there were real serious decisions that I was making before this. Um, and there's a difference between kind of like, you know, as Conum would say, system two versus system one decisions, ones that f- clearly feel more deliberative. Uh, versus ones that would be more, uh, you know, reflexive. And obviously little kids are going to be making more reflexive decisions, but obviously a lot of them. But I do remember, I think I was probably eight, having a conversation with my mother 
And so my mother uh, played piano and she wanted me to learn an instrument. So she had me in piano lessons for a year. And um, I am not musically talented <laughs> in, in the least. And it was just clear to me that this was not going to be the path that my life was going to take at all. And that really I could probably be spending my time on things that might be more fruitful. Uh, even if it was to try to create like a real well-rounded child. And I remember sitting and having a real conversation with her where I kind of laid out like, look, let's, let's agree that this is not my jam. And that no matter how long I spend on this, I am never going to be a particularly good piano player. So uh, can we talk about maybe I could spend this time that I'm doing with piano on something else? And I do actually remember having that conversation and I did convince mm. her that um, she said, you just have to only after a year. And it was already very close to a year is up. She said that then you can quit. But I did convince her to let me quit. Negotiating so. like right, right off the bat. Um, well, I was, trying, I was like, I was trying to make my case, you know, like, because it really like, I mean, I still play a tiny bit of piano, but I'm like so bad. Did you grow up thinking about decisions as as a particular thing? Like like in your family's sort of dinner table discussion, was there like, hey, this is a like deciding things is an important skill in and of itself, aside from whatever it is that you're deciding about? Uh, yeah, I would say not in the least. I mean, it, so not 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 in a an explicit way. Uh, we played a lot of games, you know, so mm -hmm. games obviously involve quite a bit of strategy, tactics, decision making. Uh, so th we were sort of living the decision making. And the thing that did happen at my dinner table was this always debate. Like it wasn't like we weren't living like the cleavers. So it was like, how is your day, Beaver? Um, it was, you know, there was always sort of heated debate going on um, at the table. So lots of sort of clashing of of different viewpoints and whatnot, uh, which I think helps you sort of think about like, how can you get into other perspectives and think about how to straw man or strong man or that kind of stuff that, that I think is really actually important for critical thinking. But no, actually very little discussion of actual decisions. And my sister and I have, have talked about this as kind of a strange sort of thing about our my family, because, you know, as I think about my college decision, for example, there was no kind of sitting down and like mapping it out or asking what my values were, or what the things are that I wanted for my life or how I might be able to achieve those goals better, depending on where I went to and how those might fit. I, I My college decision was literally, I want to be in New York City. I'm, I'm telling you, this is this is what the decision was. And so, OK, that really narrowed it down. And then I happened to have come from a family where you know, it would have been sort of expected that my that I, I should my top choice should be an Ivy League. My parents met at Harvard Graduate School. And I actually now I look back on that in horror because I don't think that that should be assumed. And I think that taking on that kind of debt and choosing that particular type of school just just because of its name or whatever would be a very bad to make a way to make a decision about college or whether to go to college. And so I'm a little horrified about what my thought process was at that point. Um, but that very, was very indicative. I mean, I, I feel like there was just sort of a lot of things that were assumed about what your goals were and how you were supposed to achieve them that weren't expressed in any kind of um, really explicit way. So I would say, like, when I look on my at my early decision making, at least in my young adulthood, I kind of say, oh, you know, it's one of those things where I, I wish I knew what I knew now because I, I think that I could have been thinking about those things much more, much more clearly here. So, yeah. Hmm. And and when do you think that, when did it really start becoming its own thing for you? Like separate from the types of decision you were making or that were the content of the decision, like, like when did you first, like, like I think about, you know, uh, some of the training that I've gone through in martial arts, for instance, right? Or even, even the Bruce Lee quote, like when you first study a punch is a punch and a kick is a kick. And then when you really start breaking it down, a punch is no longer a punch and a kick is no longer a kick, meaning that they're separate things from the actual action that you're taking. Um, interestingly, that, that quote ends when you master it, a punch goes back to being a punch and a kick goes back to being a kick. But, but somewhere in there, you know, when we're trying to master a skill like this, we decompose it into its structure. We realize it's its own thing. Things sort of separate from from what we're carrying in that vehicle. And w when did that happen for you? 
So um, I think it's so interesting because it's like, again, it depends on what the perspective is, because as it had to do with like trying to figure out the games that we were playing, like bridge or gin or that kind of thing, uh, you know, as it pertained to, you know, when I was a research assistant in college, trying to sort of deconstruct that stuff, my own research, which was about learning uh, when I was in graduate school, um, you know, I was certainly thinking about those things as objects, right? Mm -hmm. And then obviously when I got to poker, you're really thinking about that game as an object and trying to see it from all different sides and sort of figure out how you can be making better decisions um, when it comes to that and how you can kind of set up, you know, systems and, and guardrails that can help you to make sure that you are not falling into traps that you know you're likely to fall into because of the amount of uncertainty in that system. So really, you know, I mean, as far as like some of the activities that I was engaging in very, very early, because I was I was playing these games from the time I was very young. What I think is really interesting is that it wasn't until much later in life for me that I really started to bring together the cognitive science and, and what I've been doing in poker itself is kind of a, a, a real world instantiation of the kinds of things that I was learning in cognitive science, that I started to think about my own decisions in that way, mm. um, which I think is kind of interesting. There was a there was a little bit of a disconnect. Like, obviously, I was navigating this decision problem, and I was thinking about my own decisions as it related specifically to poker. But it wasn't really until, I would say, the early 2000s that I started thinking about broadly what do these backgrounds that I have start, how, how do I, how can I think about how this really informs decision-making in general? And I, I started becoming really obsessed with that topic. And that's really been the last, over, you know, 20 years of my life has been just that topic of how can you start to think broadly about decision-making given the mastery that you're sort of working toward in a particular type of arena how can we create like far transfer, as Phil T Tetlock would put it, from these areas in terms of what are what are the principles and concepts that we could be pulling out of that that would help our decisions in general? And now, when it comes to decision making in my own life, I actually apply all of these processes, and I think that like I'm a lot better off for it. And this is a little bit of that I wish, right? Was I think back to like that college decision, mm -hmm. I may have landed in the same place. The, the, you know, the college that I went to may have been the best choice for me, but I don't think that I got there with a good process. And it's that kind of would have should, like, oh, I wish that I could have applied this process to those types of decisions when I was much younger, but people weren't teaching me that. Hmm. And it seems like this might be a great time to branch into uh, a topic that's like one of the first things I learned from reading your work that I use in emergency medicine all the time, which is the idea of of sort of resulting, of taking the outcome of a decision and trying to look backward and disentangle whether there was a good or bad result from from a good or bad process behind it, um, which it seems to be what you're describing, which is that you might have ended up in a great place, but you're not really happy with how you got there. When you look back on some of your earlier decisions versus your decisions now, now that you've started melding these two worlds together, how often do you really formally go through that process of, of resulting the way that you might describe it in one of your books where you draw out the matrices and try to sort of disentangle what actually happens versus how much of it is is sort of more of an intuitive plan? Oh, that's a really good question. So uh, so it's a little bit complicated. I mean, so, so let me just say broadly, I think that that it's really important to understand what a really slow, deliberative, robust version of good decision making looks like and to know how to apply that in order that when you're in a situation where you have to go very fast, it actually will improve your ability to do that uh, with high fidelity. And it allows those more sort of quick and instinctive reactions to not remain in a black box because it gives you a way to pull them out in in a in a after action review and an after outcome review and make sure that you're sort of checking in on those faster responses that you have. So um so there's a lot of that for me. I know how to do like the full Monty here, right? But I do a lot of very quick decision making. And in fact, in, in how to decide, I have a whole chapter devoted to, to really going fast. 
Mm -hmm. The key is that you need to be going in and checking in on that a lot. So I, I just want to make it clear that I, 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 a lot of what I'm doing is fast. And I think part of that comes from poker because you're having to do these things in 30 seconds. The question is kind of what are you doing after the fact when you do have time to slow down? And that I'm doing a lot of. For most of the types of decisions that I make, I'm actually really trying to think about why did that happen? And in particular, what I really try to key in on is unexpectedness. And for me to be able to key in on unexpectedness, there's a thing that I have to have done, which is to actually be taking note either very explicitly um, or somewhat implicitly of what I what I expect of the world. Now, when I'm when I'm playing like if back before, I, you know, I retired from poker in 2012. But when I was playing poker, I was doing that in an implicit way because it was implicit in the action that I chose to take. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking about what I thought your hand was, and then that was making me act in a certain way. So sure. that, so essentially my actions created a record of what my predictions were so that I could kind of understand if 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 um, if something unfolded uh, unpredictably. But a really good decision process, um, if you have the time, should create an evidentiary record so that you can start thinking about whether things unfolded unexpectedly. So let, let me try to explain that. Sort of. So let's start with resulting um, so that we can get to why you would want to cue in on unexpectedness as opposed to just like, did the patient die or live or, you know, what was the outcome of the interaction that you had? Um, So basically what resulting is, is when you're talking about this sort of two by two that you might lay out, you could think about a good decision process could have two results, a, a good outcome or a bad outcome. So. Uh, you can think about the good decision process, good outcome is like an earned reward. You make a good decision, you got a good outcome. Uh, good decision, bad outcome would be um, just bad luck. Uh, you could have a really bad decision process and have a good outcome. So that's what I'm suggesting mm-hmm. may, my college process was. I'm very confident that my process was quite bad, but I got a very good outcome. And that would be dumb luck. So I would firmly put that in d- the dumb luck category. Um, and then you can have a bad decision process and have a bad outcome, of course, which would be just desserts. So as we think about the out, the outcomes that we've had in our lives or in our professional lives or whatever it might be, you would assume that all four of those cells would be very well populated. But as we think about outcomes, we don't actually populate them equally. Uh, and it kind of depends on the situation, but particularly as we're looking from afar um, or if we're being evaluated by someone who is our superior uh, higher up in the food chain or whatever, Mm -hmm. uh, something called resulting tends to occur, which is uh, if there's a bad outcome, we assume it came from a bad decision process. If there's a good outcome, we assume it came from a good decision process. So obviously this is really bad for learning because you can run red lights and get through safely, Right. And you can go through green lights and you can get in car accidents like we don't want to lose sight of of those two uh, kind of relationships between outcomes and decision quality. And it actually uh, sets up part of what I call the paradox of experience, which is that while we need experience to learn any individual experience that you have can really interfere with learning, because when we create these very, very tight connections between outcome quality and decision quality, what we and uh, ends up happening is that we take the bad lesson, right? We're like, it turned out well, so therefore I must have made great decisions. And now you're running red lights, basically, uh, is kind of how we think. Now, obviously, people listening might say, well, that's ridiculous. No matter what the outcome was, I would know that running a red light was wrong. Uh, and I understand that that's true, because uh, our traffic laws are very well stated, and they're not opaque to us. But for most decisions we're making, like what are the decisions we're making when when we're in the middle of treating a patient that's in an emergent situation, right? Or even if you're just thinking about like, what is my best sales strategy? These are things that are not settled. So these get into things that become much more subjective because uh, we do not know what the rules are. We don't know what the right answer is. We're generally making these types of decisions with very, very limited information. And we know that there's going to be a lot of luck involved in the way that it turns out or it doesn't turn out independent of the decision quality. So this gets into subjective, the subjective judgment territory. We're we're trying to think about, like, what are the ways that this could turn out? We can make very good educated guesses about it, but we're never going to be perfect. Um, You know, you know, and then we're trying to think about what the probability of those different things are. And again, we can make some 
educated guesses, but we're not going to be perfect simply because we're not omniscient. Mm -hmm. um, so that we think about the traffic example is, well, it's easy to see this mistake if we have some sort of omniscience, which knowing the traffic laws basically gives you. We've settled what, what you know, but that that is literal. that's not, it, I only use that to demonstrate the error. Right. Not to say like, oh, but of course you would know, because the, the fact is that we really don't know mm -hmm. in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the scenario that we find ourselves in an emergency room lends us even more to this idea of resulting, because when you put yourself in these really high stress scenarios and I would imagine naively uh, poker is similar in some sense. When you have this emotional load on top of everything you're doing, where there's this incredible high impact to your decision, life or death or win or lose a large sum of money, you know, it fires up other parts of our brain that aren't necessarily ideally suited for making really complex, thoughtful decision making processes. Right. Our, our amygdala, our hippocampus, everything gets going because we're feeling this this sort of uh, movement, this threat towards us or towards somebody. And especially after the fact, like our, our brain is pretty hardwired to avoid uh, repeated like run-ins with a saber tooth tiger, right? So if we think there's a link between a bad outcome and a bad decision, that gets burned into us pretty deeply, even without maybe our knowledge of it. So there's this, there's this extra risk of resulting when you add on all of this stress. Um, yeah, that's that's so true. And I'll, at, at the stakes in an emergency room are much higher than the stakes at poker. I just would like to say, like, <laughs> losing money is like losing money. And by the way, you're only losing your own money. Sure. I mean, sure. it really. But but you're you're absolutely right about the emotional component. So mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we know is that the prefrontal cortex uh, has an inhibitory relationship to the amygdala. Mm -hmm. um, so when the amygdala is on fire. Uh, the prefrontal cortex is pretty dark. Uh, and when the prefrontal cortex is on fire, we know the amygdala is pretty dark. So when we start to recruit um, the amygdala and hippocampus and, you know, the temporal lobe in general, um, what ends up happening, of course, is that we're kind of shutting down that the prefrontal cortex, which is obviously where we'd like to be making our decisions. But it's for just the reason that uh, we don't want to run into a lot of saber tooth tigers. And so that kind of fight or flight response of just like, get out of here, don't think about it too much is actually really important. And you can imagine like uh, someone who was really thoughtful about trying to run, say, a double blind controlled experiment about whether that's really a sable tooth, tooth tiger is probably dead. So their genes <laughs> didn't get passed on to the next generation. Uh, you know, the, the human, the, you know, human beings did really well. Uh, in these situations where you would vastly prefer a false positive, you just want, uh, you know, sensitivity is everything. Like I would, I would trade all the specificity in the world for sensitivity when I'm trying to survive mm -hmm. on the savanna. So that's kind of the situation that we're in. And, you know, obviously that doesn't, there's a lot of kind of decision-making in the modern day that doesn't really apply to those kinds of situations where we would rather get specificity recruit specificity as well and actually be more accurate as opposed to just sort of all these false positives or vice versa, maybe all these false negatives, right? Uh, we'd rather have accuracy. So um, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's obviously a lot of what you want to do. So there's, there's a couple of kind of, there's a couple of ways to deal with this problem. One is after the fact and one is before the fact. So I don't know what you want to start with. Tell me which one you want to start with. Take your pick, whatever, whatever you'd like. <laughs> Yeah. Right, let's start with after the fact. Great. Um, so one of the things that we're really trying to do is through repeated feedback loops, we're, we're trying to train our brains to say it's that, of course, we're going to get bad outcomes a lot because the world is very hard to predict. Mm -hmm. um, and so we shouldn't care so much whether the outcome is bad or good. What we should care about and what's really important for for our learning is that the outcome is unexpected. So let me let me ex explain a little. Um, so doctors have uh, uh, M and M uh, meetings, right? Absolutely. So, right. Yeah. Um, so obviously those are saying, "Oh, shoot, we had a really bad outcome," and so now we're going to have a meeting about what the process was. It's literally in the name. Yep. Morbidity and mortality. Absolutely. Right. Oh, God, something went really wrong. We better talk about it. Um, so so here's here's the interesting thing. 
if I'm saying I really care about decision process, I really care about the decisions that were made, I'm not so worried about what the outcome was. What I really care about is what, how were you thinking about the problem? in terms of your treatment of this particular patient. And we know that this is true, whether it's emergent medicine or, you know, over a much longer period of time, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and you're going to say all of these words, but, but here's the thing that I know is that I, as a resident or an intern or a doctor uh, uh, now has to defend myself in this situation, because the only way that I end up in the room is when something bad has gone on. Right. Right. So what we should actually care about is not so much the patient died, but that this went a really unexpected way because there's a couple, there's a couple of bad things that happen from just focusing on M and M. Number one is you tell people, no matter how much I say, I don't care about how it turned out. I care about how it turned out. So you better defend yourself against these bad outcomes. Right. And that's going to tend to mean you're going to do things the usual way you're going to uh, prefer to have lots of consensus. Mm -hmm. You're gonna tend to not innovate. Uh, You may, we know that there's a problem in medicine with sort of over testing, for example, like these are things that are gonna come out of this kind of like, well, I want it when I get into that room and people are, no matter how much they're saying process, I know they really cared that I had a bad outcome. So I'm going to think about how I might have a bad outcome because I want to be able to cover myself in that case so that I don't get in trouble. Mm-hmm. So that that's kind of the th- number one is you're really emphasizing that you better be able to defend yourself against something going wrong. But the, the more important problem comes from this. When you have a good result, you're not having the same meeting. Everybody's like high-fiving, patient saved, great. But the interesting thing is that that means that you're losing half of the ability to learn because if you have something bad happen, we would like to know about it, but also if you have something good happen. But what's interesting is that there is nothing to be learned from either a bad result or a good result that was fully in the expected spectrum, right? If somebody sure. comes in with a, a gunshot wound that is highly likely to be fatal, the fact that they die should not get you in a room talking about it because it seems like that was pretty obvious that that was like a very high probability event. Right. Yeah. Although Um, I think there's, there's one thing to jump into the middle of that, which is that, which is that, and maybe you're about to get into this, but like, it's not just the end outcome that makes a difference, right? It's also the path that you took of how to get there. So you can have, you know, we, what we know about, you know, GSWs to the box, right? Like incredibly high mortality, even if you do all of the different things for it. But along the way, there's also a wide variety of other decisions that are made and other steps that are taken. And sometimes there's actually a lot of deep information in those about process improvement, how you're thinking and how you got there. So it's important, I think, to make sure that you're looking at not just the end of the day outcome, like what's the patient's 30 day mortality, but also like, you know, what are the steps that it took to get there? Did you set the room up appropriately? Did you take your like team on the right path? Did you lead the resuscitation well? And I think that's another set of information that gets just just like we don't really analyze good outcomes all the time. Like we lose a lot of potential growth and learning because we tend to focus on the end of the day, big picture outcomes as opposed to the steps. Completely. I I totally agree. So this actually helps you to get there Mm -hmm. because I want you to talk about process, but I want you to talk about process when results are somewhat unexpected. So you are going to have plenty of situations that you're going to be able to discuss where somebody's went some the course of of a, a patient, the course that a patient took was unexpectedly poor. You, but my point is that you should also be talking about just as deeply when the course that a patient takes is unexpectedly good. Because if you don't, you are losing half of your learning opportunities. Not only that, you are now losing the opportunity to reinforce for the pe- the people who are having to make those decisions that we have a set of expectations about the way that the course for this patient might go, given the processes that we have in place. But we only care if it goes south. I don't understand. We should care that it goes that it went much better than we expected. What is it about our expectations? Should we be adjusting our expectations? Is there something different that happened that maybe is uh, 
causative to the fact that that went really well, because we would really like to understand that. Was there more uh, variance in what the the range of outcomes that this patient might experience than we, than we had otherwise identified? For example, that we should understand that was this like a real outlier or is this something that would naturally more be in the range? And there are certain things that we could do that could increase the probability of landing in that range in the future, for example. Mm -hmm. And it tells the people that are working for you that it's not about failure or success. It's about how are you thinking about how your actions along the way, the process that you're doing uh, is affecting your expectations of what the end result will be or the results along the way will be for this patient. So that's the, the first thing that I would say is that stop with the M&M &M and start thinking about like when a, a result is out of range of what you would expect for the procedures that were in place and for the condition that the patient came in and for what the, the, the situation was, that that's what you should be talking about so that you cannot lose half of those opportunities. The, I think the reason why we tend to focus on the, on the bad stuff is that there's some psychological safety in doing so, which is basically when you have a bad outcome, uh, well, you've had a bad outcome. So you're already not feeling very good about what happened. So if we now open that up to a, to a big process dive, you can't really lose to the process dive. If you, sure. if you found out, okay, well, we made some mistakes, fine, because you're already pretty sad, right? And, and at least maybe you can learn from those mistakes. And if you find out that the process was fine, you get to say that you were just unlucky and now actually you won to it. So so either you sort of stay in, stay in the state you were in bef prior to the meeting because like, well, I had a bad outcome. I'm beating myself up and I'm really sad. So you exit feeling the same way or you find out that it was really due to luck. It wasn't something in your control. And now all of a sudden you're happy. Now think about when you have a patient who does really well, when you save that patient and you now open that up to a process dive. What is to be won from that, right? You're already happy. Okay, so if you find out that you made great decisions along the way, you're still happy, who cares? But what if you find out that there were a whole bunch of things that you could clean up, a whole bunch of mistakes that you made that were actually lowering the probability that that patient was gonna have the, that result. Um, and you did a whole bunch of stuff wrong along the way to that great result. Well, now you just lost to it, hmm. right? So so I think that we just tend not to 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 look at those good results and say, we need to understand what's to be learned from those unexpectedly good results. And we don't want to leave those by the wayside. So that's like the, the after piece. That's, that's awesome. And you do this, uh, you do such a good job explaining this sort of like dichotomy of, of decision-making in your book. When you talk about the idea between a free roll and a free donut, right. Which is that like, it feels like a free roll to us because we're already sad, like, well, we may as well do it. But over time, when we, when we continue to make that same mistake over and over again, we will end up in a much worse position than we are right now because we're, we're losing all of this. Uh, um, we're losing all of this knowledge. Um, yeah. And, and, and the thing is that I think that it should become obvious. I hope that once you sort of treat the world in this way, the, you do actually get there are there's a lot to be won from it, not just in terms of like how much how much faster you're going to learn and how your ability to come overcome the paradox of experience. I mean, this is the solution to resulting. Right. It's to say the result I care about is whether it was unexpected. Mm -hmm. I just I like literally I'm neutral to whether I won or lost. I just care about like, did I predict your hand correctly? I, right. I I thought that if I raised, you were going to act in this certain way, and you didn't. So I should probably think about what my models of the world are, because that's really weird. Like, I thought there was no possibility that you could possibly be holding a jack-10, and then we finished the hand, and you turned your cards over, and you had a jack-10. I don't care if I won the hand or not. I got it completely wrong. Like, And I would like to learn for the future, and it stops me from worrying so much about whether I won or lost the hand, but whether I actually properly predicted the world. And this is the thing that overcomes the paradox of experience. It really speeds learning up. So that that's kind of the first piece. Now, what, obviously what goes along with that is that you have to have, you have to always be thinking about what do you expect the world to be? Mm -hmm. What what are the things that you're predicting are going to occur? So, so it's helpful. For example, if you're seeing a patient to actually write down in a very specific way, what do I think the probability is of, right? And then identify what these things are, you know, or you can even make predictions about, um, you know, I think that the probability, uh, there's a particular, pro you know, there's a prob there's a 60% probability that the patient uh, is going to live, um, but uh, 
you know, I think it, the course, you know, before they're fully healthy, it's going to be two weeks or four weeks or six weeks and actually start to write those expectations mm-hmm. down. And a lot of good is going to come from that because when you do that, first of all, if we do that independently, we, I get to find out that you actually have a different viewpoint than I do. Maybe I think there's a 60% chance the patient is going to survive and you think there's a 40% chance the patient is going to survive. And it's very important for not for us not just to think, I think there's a good chance because we don't know sure. really what that means, but actually be specific in the forecast. This now gets us to see, oh, I disagree. And now I can learn from Dan and Dan can learn from me because we can have a conversation about why he says 40% and I say 60%. And that's actually mm-hmm. going to improve the decision making in the moment. But as you start to make those forecasts across patients, it becomes a way for you to calibrate to when a patient comes in in a certain condition. Now, when we go back to that idea of how do you make really good decisions in the moment when you're under pressure? Well, one way is that you're just really well calibrated to the situation that you're in. So if you force yourself to say, here's, I'm just gonna quick, I'm gonna write down the percentage chance that this person has has of survival. And then across all the patients that you see, you start to see how good of a predictor am I of that? Do I actually predict that pretty well? And if you're off, if you're overly optimistic or overly pessimistic or whatever, we're going to start to reveal that. And if you and I are both treating the patient and we just quick write that down and we see that there's dispersion, it gives us that moment to say, why do you think something different than I do that might improve the the treatment that the patient gets? Because we have a chance to uncover that. Right. So now we and now we know what we mean by unexpected. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. these things do not take a long time to do. These are things yeah. that you can do in the moment. Let's just quick write down what, what's the probability of survival. Sure. It takes one second to do it. So I think that I think that that's, you know, sort of part of this idea of how do you create really good post work? Yeah. It, you know, I'm struck as you're saying this about what a unique time in sort of um, recent history it is for us to be having this conversation, because there's been this sea change in emergency medicine lately with the with COVID sort of coming on the scene, um, in part because it was it's one of the only times in recent history where every single emergency doctor is sudden and, and many, many other people besides are suddenly dealing with an entirely new type of problem in which we have very little from Bayesian standpoint, prior knowledge about what's happening. And so everything is unexpected and the ability to predict things is so low. So what you said earlier about, I am 100% or I'm sorry, not 100%. I am highly like 75% sure you don't have a Jack 10. And when you have a Jack 10, that exposes to me that I had a fundamental flaw in my logic. I have said that exact thing when I'm talking about a patient's um, pulse oximetry meeting, which is that I am 100% or 75% sure, sorry, I'm trying to get better at that, 75% sure that that number can't be below 30 and compatible with life. And in fact, I've used that to say, hey, I think the machine is malfunctioning, not the patient right now. Except that now in COVID, you have people that walk in with oxygen sats in the 20s. And so it really is shaking up all of our understanding of the universe. And we're forced to sort of reinvent our understanding of what is expected and unexpected uh, as we're trying to go through all this process. And so whether you're a brand new doctor just starting this past July or you're much further in your career, you're sort of faced with uh, part of the, the landscape of certainty is really just not there the way that it was before. And I'm curious how we're going to get through that and and continue to do this, because I love this idea of focusing more on what's unexpected in my cases. But like you said, it implies really two things. One is some sense of what's supposed to happen or what what my knowledge of my prior knowledge is. And then the other really crucial thing that is such a challenge for emergency medicine is a closed loop about what actually happens, because we so often don't get that result or we don't get that result for days or if at all. Um, and that's really a thing that that we need in order to have this. And so I, I guess I'd ask what your advice is in these situations, either when certainty is scarce and or when feedback loops are scarce. How do we still learn under those conditions? Yeah, oh gosh, that's such a great question. So let me just say this is actually a very poker like problem because mostly at the end of poker, you don't get to see the hand. It's not sure. like watching it on TV when you're when you're playing, particularly at the levels that I used to play at. Uh, I think it's 11% of the time do you get to see your opponent's cards. So huh. um, so you're kind of in the same situation, like, oh, I don't really know. So so let me just, let me say a few things about that, because I think it's such an interesting problem. So if we can work through it together, maybe that would be yeah. really cool. Um, so first of all, uh, 
the certainty is mostly an illusion anyway. So let me just say, like, I know that uncertainty is slapping everybody in the face right now with COVID, but believe me, like the world as it was prior to COVID was kind of abutting this amount of certainty. We were just really good at fooling ourselves into thinking that we're pretty Absolutely. sure of things. Yeah. Uh, to the point of like, to your point, like you were very certain that you could, you know, uh, pull socks below 30 could not support life. Uh, and yet look at that. It does. So there you go. That's something <laughs> you were very certain about that maybe. Right. So, um, so we think we we generally have an illusion of control that we have more control over outcomes than we actually do with this. There's status quo bias that things as they are today will remain. So in the future, there's certainly overconfidence and um, a whole bunch of just a lot of the cognitive biases are around this idea that we think that the world is a much more uncertain place. So with COVID, I think that uh, it actually offers an opportunity to really understand how to how to make really good decisions, whether COVID is around or not for the reason that you have to confront how to deal with uncertainty in your decisions. Mm -hmm. So let's just start with the knowledge problem, because I think that this is a really great um, place to start. So uh, so when we think about so what are the results, you know, how, how do we figure out like what outcome we're going to observe or what we think the outcomes are going to be uh, when we make a decision? We, we know that there's this really big problem that we have. I can have this amazing decision process, right? I can know how to identify my options. I can know that for any option, I'm supposed to forecast the chances that certain outcomes will occur, try to assign probabilities to those, think about how risk averse I am. Like, what, you know, obviously when you're thinking about a tra treatment for COVID, um, you know, like if you're thinking about hydroxychloroquine, it's not a free roll in the sense that we know that there are risks to, to hydroxychloroquine, particularly in the cardiac, um, arena. And then you need to think about, okay, so what are the gains that I'm going to get from that? And what's the probability that the patient that I would be giving this to are going to experience these risks that are really going to be, uh, uh, create a higher mortality rate compared to if I weren't to give them to treatment and so on and so forth. These are, these are complicated, but this is, we know this is what you're supposed to be doing, right? I can think about the option of, of giving hydroxychloroquine versus not giving hydroxychloroquine. And I can now map out you know, what the downside risk is either way, what the upside risk is either way, what the probability of those things unfolding is, and then I can actually decide what, what option I'm supposed to choose. But the problem is, and this was, has cer was certainly the case, particularly early on with something with, like hydroxychloroquine, is that while we know what that process is, it's built on a foundation of the things we believe to be true of the world. In other words, what do we know? Mm -hmm. And what we know is imperfect, always. So we, and when we think about that, it's like what we know is like sort of fits on the head of a pin and what we don't know is like the size of the universe. Uh, so we have sort of a flimsiness to that foundation that that decision process is built on uh, that just has to do with breadth of knowledge. Um, and that's something that we're really finding out in a way that, that should create a lot of humility for us with COVID, how, really how little, how little we know, right? Like, so we can think, so we're sort of faced with, with the flimsiness of the foundation in terms of the breadth of our knowledge. But then also we know that some things we believe uh, are inaccurate. For example, that a pull socks of below 30 would not sustain life. So that was an inaccuracy that you had. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're really trying to do is say, if we recognize that COVID or otherwise, we always have beliefs that are imperfect. And we accept that then what we can say is, okay, my job is to try to figure out how to make that foundation better. And the only way that I can make that foundation better is to actually figure out what are the things that I could find out? What is the knowledge that's available? How do I maximize my ability to sort of search through that universe of stuff that I don't know that's both going to make me collide with corrective information and make me adjust my model really quickly? In other words, how many times do I have to run into a patient whose pulse ox is below 30 before I'm willing to change my belief. Sure, sure. That's a big deal, right? Because we know that people won't change their beliefs, right? They'll say that, that this is an unusual case. It's an outlier. This uh, The machine is broken. As you said, mm -hmm. like there's ways to sort of keep your model intact. So that's that's kind of number one. And then how do I make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm colliding with different perspectives? And that is to, and the way to do that is to say a couple of things. One is I will not accept the idea that I'm ever guessing. I am only educated guessing. In other words, there is nothing that I could be making a decision about that I know nothing about. So I'll, I'll just like give you a super example. We're obviously like we're, we're on 
a, a super simple example. I mean, mm -hmm. we're we're on um we're we're on a computer, so you can't see anything that my computer is sitting on. Sure. Um, but my computer is sitting on a a table that I stole from my patio. Um because I'm in a little room that's a house that I'm not normally in. But anyway, I stole it from my patio. So it's, it's sitting on a table. Um, so let me ask you a question. You can't see the table, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, how much do you think the table weighs? How like, much give me a range. Yeah, yeah, how much does the table weigh that my computer's on? Um, so probably anywhere from, you want, you want a range or an actual guess first? Give me both. Give me both. Okay, so I would say a range uh, is anywhere from, maybe like five pounds to probably more like 35 pounds. And 35 pounds would be a really heavy table. So probably it's closer to somewhere, if it's from your patio, it's maybe metal. And so it's probably somewhere 10, 15 pounds. Right. So, and, and I gave you some information, right? So you know mm -hmm. it wasn't a dining room table. Right. Right. I told you I stole it from my patio. Right. So, so that's interesting. You can't even see the table. Mm -hmm. But you know a lot about tables. So by my making you say, you, you're not allowed to say, I don't know, because I've never seen this before. Sure. Um, it makes you start to think about, well, what are the things that I know that I could recruit? That's number right. one. Number two is it starts to make you search for, for good reference classes. And this is particularly if you make these kinds of guesses explicit, right? Because you know that you're going to go back and look at it. So if you know you're going to go back and look at it to see how well calibrated you are to the world, it actually makes you want to be more accurate. That actually creates a desire for accuracy. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, oh, this is something I think, it's like, no, I think this patient has a 60% chance of survival. Well, across all the patients that you say there's a 60% chance of survival, does Dan, how close is it to 60? Like, how good sure. is Dan's assessment of that? So anyway, so even if you have something like COVID, which is unknown, it's not like you don't know things about the human body. Mm -hmm. It's not like you don't know things about coronaviruses. Sure. It's you know we you know a lot about SARS, you know, right. you know so on and so forth. And you can start to say what are the appropriate reference classes that that I can pull in here that are going to help me at least be better educated in my guess. Well, well, while I understand that I do not know nearly as much about this disease as I do about H1N1. Mm -hmm. I do not know nothing. And if I am constantly saying, what do I know and what can I find out, you will start to build models of the disease that are more accurate much, much more quickly. And it gets you to get out of this idea of putting a stake in the ground. So what I mean by that is that, for example, if you really believe that it's a respiratory disease, okay, the likelihood how long it will take you to shift off of that is going to be longer if you're not always thinking about how can I be updating my knowledge? Like, how can I be closing these feedback loops? In other words, for right now, my best guess is that it's a respiratory disease. But as I get more information, I may be updating that versus sticking your your belief stake in the ground, your identity. This is a respiratory disease. And then as you start to have people coming in with like very weird ischemias and uh, you know, Blood clots, all sorts of things, right? Right. You know, why is this person see, seeming to have inflammation in the heart wall? This is a little confusing to me. You'll just say, oh, that must just be a, it's, you know, it's a side effect or something mm -hmm. like this is not, and you're not going to shift off your model really quickly. So, so the idea is this, that you should never accept, I don't know very much. So therefore I'm kind of done because I, I, I'm sort of waiting. You should be the one that's proactively saying, look, if I can figure out, if you give me an equation like uh, 30 plus 30, I am better off if I don't think that's negative infinity to positive infinity. And even if I can't figure out that that's 60, I'm going to make a lot better decisions if I can figure out it's somewhere between 15 and 100. Mm -hmm. That right. is still a lot of the way there. And it reinforces this open mindedness that I don't have the exact answer right now. This is my best guess right now. And hopefully there's other information that I could go find out that would actually help me with this, that would start to get me to, to get hungry, to explore that universe of stuff I don't know to improve my decision-making as I go forward. Does that make sense? 
It does. And, and you'd think that as emergency doctors, we'd be good at this, this idea of you're not allowed to say, I don't know, because your patient is sitting there in front of you and they're suffering and they demand answers because if you don't give any answers, then they're going to suffer more and maybe die. And so you have to, you're already in the process in the, in the, um, uh, you're already in practice of giving answers even when you don't know. And in fact, most of the time we don't know, and we're only sort of vaguely approaching something that resembles more certainty than uncertainty. Um, and still, that's an interesting thing. And, and you know, when you were like, Dan, how much does this table weigh? I was like, oh, cool. My heart rate's going up as I'm trying to answer this question because it's forcing me to, like, put something explicitly. And that's kind of ridiculous because you're right. Like, I should be doing that more often. And I'm also... Um, if any of my if any of my current residents are listening to this, I'm I'm grinning evilly right now because I'm going to be like asking this question to you guys all the time now, uh, even as I'm trying to answer it myself. Um, but so make but that- like, and one of the things is like if you're actually like if you're doing rounds, for example, mm-hmm. and you want to ask them like obviously not super in front of the patient, what's the <laughs> probability that this patient survives? Sure. You don't have them answer in a group. Say everybody pull out a piece of paper and write it down. Right. And the reason that you want to do that is that actually there was this really great study by um, Richard Zeckhauser and Dan Levy. It was like this super simple study. Uh, they, they're professors at Harvard, and they just had uh, one section of a big lecture answer questions by raising their hand. Um, and what they found was that when they answered questions by raising their hand, these super majorities formed mm-hmm. where like it's like people you can imagine people are sort of looking around being like, oh. Dan sure. looks like a smart person. He, re- I'll just raise my hand yeah. along with him. Um, but when they had them asked by clicker, what you saw is all this dispersion, like the the super majorities right. uh, broke up. So the thing is that groups really like to to agree with each other. In particular, particular, they tend to be looking for cues from the people who they think are maybe smarter or senior, um, or residents, senior or whatever. Right. So if you just ask people to write it down on a piece of paper then you they can hand it to somebody and then you can see where they're just you know oh there's actually a wide variety of opinions on this um number one it gets you to see what the range of knowledge is but it actually creates really good conversation because uh you can then start a conversation this is really key where the conversation is not to convince everybody of one answer it's to uncover what the reasoning is Mm. behind why and this is actually incredibly helpful regardless of whether you're the person who's right or whether you're the person who's wrong. And it's certainly helpful to the people listening to the conversation. So if you're the person who's wrong, obviously you can see why it's helpful. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, by the way, both people are wrong in the sense that the answer lies in between. But so in those situations, we can see why it's helpful. You now have an opportunity to correct your beliefs. So I'm like uh, uh, literally right out of medical school. And I think that there's a 80% chance that the patient is going to survive. And and you say, much more experienced, actually, that your belief is there's a 35% chance, and now I get a chance to learn from you. Yeah, right? Why absolutely. am I over-optimistic? Right? Uh, and that discussion is going to improve the knowledge of the group, particularly for people who otherwise maybe wouldn't have answered, suggested that question. But the interesting thing is that even if you're on the right side of that argument, it's actually incredibly helpful for you to engage in that conversation because me – as say the intern is saying to you, why? Mm-hmm. Why do you believe this? And this is, it forces you to be able to explain why you believe something in a way that another human being can then take it away and repeat it in the, in the sense of what, how, how, why are you choosing a screwdriver to put that screw into the wall? And now you have to explain it to me and you have to explain its use such that you could hand me the screwdriver and I would know what to do or that I could identify proper uses of screwdrivers in the future. And by the way, that's not a small thing. Mm -hmm. So like I have a very simple example in the book, which just goes like this. I assume you believe the earth is round. I hope so. Um, True for the record. Yes. Yeah, for the record. Um, So here's my question to you without, without Googling anything, how, how well do you think you would do if you happen to run into a flat earther Mm -hmm. and you had to give quality scientific arguments for why the earth is round that didn't include things like everybody says so that's that's as parents we know that punt sure um or like uh unless you're an expert in photo doctoring i don't think you're allowed to say like well because there's photos of the earth from space because you have to you'd have to be able to tell me like if you had to guess like on a scale of zero to five like what the quality of your arguments were where five would be like amazing totally convincing versus zero would be crap where yeah. I know where I sit. 
I'm, I'm, I'm shaking my head. I, I think that I'd, I'd maybe come up with uh, one or two arguments that were high threes or fours, but the majority would probably be be low threes in there. Anything yeah, I'd probably I mean, base I, a decision I, on. I, I think I'd be like a one. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I'd be able to say I'd be able to say a few things about like the horizon. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Like, exactly. I, you, you know, I, it would be it would be bad, right? I, I think yeah. I might be able to say something about like the the sort of magnetic like we have these magnetic poles and that seems very weird, but anyway, it would be bad. It would be real. I'd be horrible. At it. Yeah. So, but, so this is the thing is that there's a lot of things that we, we know are true. And, and until someone questions us on it, someone who doesn't understand it, we're forced to convey the rationale for why we believe what we do. It actually improves the quality of my knowledge. So if I run into a flat earther and then I want to come back to them with good arguments, I have to go like Google some stuff. I have to do some research. And now my belief is going to be shift from like, well, I just know this thing is true to I understand it and I understand why it's true. And then sometimes you're going to find out it's mostly true, but there's some piece of it that you actually need to amend. And that's really good for you because the other person is just asking you to, to tell you why. So, so exposing this dispersion in this way where you don't have people answering like in a group setting, you give them some way to answer independently it's actually incredibly helpful for like speeding up the learning of the group, but then selfishly for really improving your own beliefs and your own decisions, because you now are forced to expose yourself to people who may think otherwise. Yeah. And I mean, that's one of the total joys of working with residents and training the next generation of doctors is because you go see a patient, you're like, we're going to do this. And you get a, a room full of smart people going, why are you going to do that? And you find the holes in your knowledge much quicker when you're forced to defend it like that. Um, and think about how much you would add to that if you ask them in advance, what do you think you should do? And they all wrote it down on a piece of paper. Yeah. And then you'd be able to see like, you know, one person thinks you're supposed to do this, one person thinks you're supposed to do this. And then you could ask them, why, why do you believe that? Why do you think that, that, that that's what you should do so that you can understand? It's gonna help you understand like what have you taught them in the past that might've led mm -hmm. them to believe that, what, you know, what, how other, are other people viewing it? And then here's the amazing thing is that, sorry, I'm just turning off the air conditioning. Um, no uh, here's the amazing thing is that sometimes through that process of asking them what they think you should do first before you announce your intentions, you'll actually find a novel way to treat a patient that you otherwise may not have come to. Because I guarantee you, the minute you say what you're going to do, none of those people are disagreeing with you none of those people are telling you they think there's a better way. Right. But if you get them to tell you what would, what would your, like, how would you treat this patient? What would your choice be? And you have them like write it down and then hand it up. It, it actually allows you, okay, very occasionally you're gonna go, oh, you know what? That's actually a better way. I didn't think about that. What an Amazing. interesting thing to do. Let me do that. And you'd like the opportunity to occasionally have those breakthroughs aside from educating the, the room and understanding why they think that that's the appropriate course of treatment. That's awesome. I, I am on night shifts the rest of the week, and I'm going to try that for all of our all of our rounds. We're going to be running some experiments about that. Oh, I love it. I love it. Super cool. Um, Annie, I want to shift gears slightly. Mindful of our time, I had I asked a bunch of people before uh, this this conversation what they wanted to ask you, and so this is sort of a poll of the audience from a bunch of you know, and I didn't do it so their results were hidden. So maybe we're getting some some knock on effects like you're talking That's about okay. here. It but uh, I asked a bunch of them what they wanted to what they wanted advice about what they wanted help with. And, and the theme that emerged was how do we um, when we have these decision support structures, when we have these ideas of how to make decisions that are better, how do we apply those ideas when things are really hard, really bad, when we're already on tilt, when the patient has already had a bad outcome, when, or rather when we realize that something has happened and now we have to make the next decision better? So uh, I wonder if you have any advice for, for all of us listening about that, about how to apply that in those moments. Sure. It, you know, obviously these things are very hard. Um, so what I'd love to do is kind of think about some frameworks for thinking through these things. Uh, the first thing that I think is a really helpful, uh, tool is, is called a category decision. So what is a category decision? Basically it's recognizing there are going to be certain times when I'm going to be faced with individual decisions where I know that my decision-making ability is going to be compromised. So, um, here's a very classic example. 
I would like to eat healthier, but donuts look yummy. So, so when I'm actually faced with a donut, there's going to be all sorts of stuff that's happening in my brain that it's going to short circuit mm-hmm. my ability to think about my long term healthy eating goals uh, that may make me actually go for the donut when it that's actually not in alignment with what my stated long term goals are. So, um, so we can think about category decisions as basically uh, a way to deal with that. One of the ways to sort of discover the kinds of things. So let me say what a category decision is, and then and then I'll say what how you might discover category decisions. Um, a category decision is basically saying when I'm faced with this particular category, I've already decided how I will react. Mm-hmm. So for me, as an example, I'm a vegan. That's a really good example of a category decision. It means that when as I face food out in the world, I have eliminated a whole bunch of stuff. So I'm not saying I would like to eat less meat or I would like to consume less dairy uh, where they may sound similar, but they're actually quite different because if that's what I've said, then every time that I come up against a piece of cheese or uh, a juicy steak, which is a food that I love, um, it's actually just not an option anymore because I already eliminated it. Mm Uh, so, so we want to be thinking about category decisions, right? Like what are the, what are the things, options that are available to me and what aren't? And we would like to do that in advance of actually coming up against the, the decision that's going to cause us to go astray. So how would we actually discover places where a category decision would make sense? And it's, you would use something that I call the Dr. Evil game. Um, and it's adapted from Dan Egan, um, who had something called the Damien game, which was in a similar, uh, it's a similar vein, but I adapted this and sort of built upon that tool that that he offered. So here's the Dr. Evil game. Dr. Evil has control of your brain. Um, And, you know, he's trying to make you fail because he's Dr. Evil. But here's the catch. Dr. Evil is an evil genius. So he knows that he can't get caught. So as an example, if your goal is to eat healthier, Dr. Evil isn't going to turn your brain on so that you eat like literally three pizzas and and seven pints of Ben and Jerry's in one sitting, because first of all, anybody around you is going to notice that you've done this and you're going to notice that you've done this and you're going to figure out, wait a minute, what the hell happened? It was like someone had control of my brain. So instead, what Dr. Evil does is he says, I'm going to figure out what are the decisions that you could make that in any individual instance of the decision would be perfectly rationalizable. So so it's not going to be something that's going to be easily spotted from the outside. Mm-hmm. And it's not going to be something that you're going to be spot able to spot in yourself. But as you repeat that decision over and over again, it will surely cause failure. So uh, an example of a Dr. Evil decision would actually be if I'm trying to eat healthier, then uh, Dr. Evil is not going to have me eat three pizzas and seven pints of ice cream at once. Instead, it's going to be, it's my kid's birthday party and I don't, I'm going to eat the cake. And I had a bad breakup. And so I had some ice cream and I was at work back when we went to work. Although I guess you go to work all the time, which thank you very much for your service. Uh, absolutely. Um, you are a hero for that. Oh. Um, but so, so, you know, to someone, it's like someone brought in donuts as a thank you and mm-hmm. everybody was in the break room having donuts and I didn't want to sort of sit there and not have them. And, I had a great date, and so I was, you know, celebrating by sharing a yummy piece of chocolate cake or whatever. And you can see that you, like, even if you're my friend, and I've asked you to help me with this healthy eating, that uh, if you ask me about any one of those incidents, I can be like, well, like, I was having a great date. Like, obviously, I'm trying to eat healthy in general, but I was having a great date, Dan. Like, what did, what did you think sure. I was going to do? Like, the, my date wanted to share a piece of chocolate cake. I didn't want to say no. And you're going to be like, oh, that seems reasonable. But you notice that if I keep doing that over and over mm-hmm. again, this can be very bad for my blood sugar levels and my BMI and, you know, my heart health and all these things that I'm actually trying to improve. So that's a really good example of a Dr. Evil decision. Uh, another example of a Dr. Evil decision would be actually the way that the NFL generally uh, uh, acts toward fourth down decisions. So we know that there's great analytics about when you should go for it on fourth down. Uh, but the NFL is pretty crap. At actually following the analytics, but here's why you know it's a Dr. Evil decision, because they they go against the analytics, but it's own, only ever in one direction. Mm. So it's it always sounds pretty justifiable. It's like yeah, well you know it was borderline, and the analytics kind of said that we should go for it, 
But my running back wasn't performing that day or the line wasn't holding. They weren't finding the holes, blah, blah, blah. And then they don't go for it. Have you ever heard a coach say, I know the analytics said we shouldn't go for it, but we did because the line was holding and the running back was doing a great job. And so it's, of course, you never hear that. And that's how you know it's a Dr. Evil decision. Hmm. So, so this is a really good exercise for people to do. If I were to think about Dr. Evil really making me make decisions that are likely to really reduce the probability that I have good outcomes, what yeah. are the ones that he could make me make where if I looked at it in the aggregate, I could see that it was a mistake, but any individual decision that I might make would be easily justifiable, right? So, um, so actually, interestingly enough, some of the issues with, um, you know, over testing go into mm -hmm. that category, right? Any individual case, you can justify the test. You have to look in the aggregate to see that there's a problem with this, right? So that's a great thing to make a category decision about because once you identify that uh, that's the type of decision that you're facing, you can actually decide, I, I will only follow the analytics or, I, I, you know, I am, not a, I am not a sugar eater as opposed to I am trying to eat less sugar. It's I do not eat things with refined sugar in them. But that, that would be a category decision. So that's one of the ways that you can sort of handle this stuff is through making these types of decisions. Another thing that you can do is, uh, particularly for um, decisions that are gonna repeat, which I imagine you see a lot of repeating decisions in what you do, you can um, think about uh, what are, basically what are the questions that need to be asked? You can make a checklist, which is actually really good to do. And that checklist should basically be of this form. As in, well in advance, I should say, if someone came to me and they were asking for advice about what they should have done in a situation like this or what they should do in a situation like this, what are the, what's the information that I would need to know in order to offer them advice? And what are the things that I would offer them advice on? So you have those two questions, right? So now you actually create a checklist for those situations so that in the moment you must get that information, whatever's available, that would that that is now on that list that you created in advance. And that what if you're trying to get feedback from anyone in the room, you've already you already know what you're trying to get feedback about. This actually helps you to get past the fact that in the moment you may be emotional, you know, you that emotional part of your brain. And it's really easy to sort of like not not go through that sort of checking off of what's the information that I need or asking the right questions of people. But if you have a decision that repeats a lot, you can actually create these kinds of checklists that, again, is based on if I were in the if someone came to me for advice about the situation, what sort of what are the things that I would need to know and what is the advice that I would be trying to give somebody um, and separate those into two two categories and then offer people that information and then get that get that feedback back from them. And make that part of the process as you've thought about that in advance, because you know that you that those are the things that you would need, right? Um, and then the, the last thing that you can do, uh, just this is just in terms of sort of what's the advanced stuff you can do in order to reduce to reduce the impact of emotion, is to do what's called a pre-mortem, which is much more fun than a post-mortem. Yeah. Uh, and basically say um, when I'm sort of faced with these types of decisions, I. Uh, let's imagine that I failed, what are the things that went wrong? And uh, once you can identify those things that might have gone wrong, you can actually start doing things about them, right? So you can recognize them more quickly. You can start seeing that those things are going wrong faster because you've identified them in advance. Um, so, so the first, and these all go into the same strategy, which is we're pretty crap at making decisions in the moment we're under, when we're under a lot of pressure. So as much as you can do the work in advance, you're better off. Definitely. And, and I'm, I'm thinking about myself in the middle of a resuscitation room when something went wrong or you missed an intubation and you have just a second to sort of reset yourself for the next pass of the thing and the patient's desaturating and you're in that moment. And thinking ahead of time about that, about imagining you're going to be in that, what went wrong, what are you going to do next for it? And what are all of, in the words of, of um, 
Amy Hildreth, a friend of mine, an ER doctor, and another guest on this podcast, looking ahead of time at what are the unnecessary opportunities for failure in this situation and seeking ahead to try to address them, right? Which which I don't think I would have called the Dr. Evil game until now, but like that's such a better name for it than unnecessary opportunities for failure. But what are the little things that, that seem justifiable in the moment, but that are going to trip you up in aggregate as you repeat that scenario over and over again? Right. And and then the, the other advantage of the Dr. Evil game, like once you identify what those unnecessary routes to failure are, um, it, it should be elevated then in whatever post decision process you're making, mm-hmm. because now what happens is that when you say to me, oh, I had a piece of cake at my friend's birthday party, I don't just leave it at that. I say, hold mm-hmm. on a second. This is the type of decision that we said we were going to elevate and talk about. So let me ask you some questions. Uh, how many times in the month before that did you make a similar decision, right? So, so now we know that we need to spend a little extra time and not just accept the explanation that's given to us. I know I didn't do this, but here's why. You know, it was in the moment, it was really fast, and I was attending to this other thing, and that just seemed less important in this moment. Okay, well, this may be so, but I have to elevate that in the process, and I have to say, okay, have you, how, have you been making that decision a lot recently? I need to explore more like what were the circumstances that actually led you to to skip that step, um, you know, so on and so forth. That first of all uh, is going to really help in terms of these kind of after after the decision is done. What are you doing in order to improve the decision making going forward? Because you know that you're not going to allow those things to slide. Now you're actually going to pay some attention to them. But also in the moment that you're making the decision, there's going to be this thing in your brain that goes, "Oh shit, I'm going to get asked about this later." Right. So I should probably pay attention to this now, and it will improve the quality of your, de- your the decisions that you make in that way and reduce the chances that you're doing those little things that will cause you failure just because you know they're going to get elevated later and someone's actually going to ask you about it. So cool. I, I could sit here and talk about this with you for hours and take away so much to give to my teams. And just thank you. This is awesome. Um, I, I hate to even do this, but I think I have to bring us to a close from from timing. And so I'm going to ask as a, a final parting question, um, what challenge do you have for everybody listening to this? If you want them to do one thing differently tomorrow uh, or on their next shift, what is it that you want them to do? I will, I can tell you, I know exactly what it is, because I think this would be the single most impactful thing that you could do. When you're asking for someone's opinion, do not offer your opinion first. Now, I know it sounds really simple, but it is really hard. And there is nothing that is going to improve. I, I think that that might have the biggest impact on your ability to actually have really constructive conversations where you discover disagreement, where you stop influencing other people to your side and instead start exploring what those other people believe. And I don't care whether it's someone who is uh, someone who is more advanced, more of a subject matter expert than you are, or someone who is less of a subject matter expert than you are. I don't care where you are in the chain. If you want someone's feedback, do not offer what you believe first. Like, I, so so let me try to ground it so people understand what I mean. Super simple. Like, I'm playing a poker hand and someone raises in front of me and I look down at ace queen. Um, I've, I've played the hand already. I have two ways that I could ask for your feedback about it. I You know, after I give you all the facts that you need. And there's a lot of facts that you need there. But let's assume that I've given you all the facts that you need and now I'm asking for your opinion. I could either say, so I raised, what would you have done? Mm-hmm. Don't do that. Uh, but that's how people talk. Or I could say, uh, so, so someone raised in front of me and I looked down at Ace Queen, what do you think I should have done? Right? So if you're asking for someone's opinion on diagnosis, don't say what your diagnosis is first or what you think the range of possible diagnoses are. Don't don't give that. Give them the, the same information that you had at the moment that you formed your opinion and nothing more. Do not offer them your opinion. If that is the only thing that you ever changed about your decision making, I think you would do a lot better in life. Amazing. Annie, thank you so much. It is like totally a pleasure and an honor to talk to you about this. Um, thank you. Well, I, I would just like to say I I do not deserve that. You deserve the honor for what you do and putting yourself in the front lines. And, uh, you know, this is a really risky. I mean, you know, there there are so many things about being an emergency room doctor that, that are already, uh, I imagine I'm not one, but I imagine so incredibly difficult. Uh, in terms of sort of what you're facing every single day. 
But uh, to be facing that and putting yourself at risk with a virus where the consequences of getting it are really super unknown, um, I, I can't even imagine. And I am so grateful for the people who are our frontline healthcare workers. And so I, I would actually like to say it is my honor. And I'm incredibly grateful for everybody who is doing what you do. Okay, folks, that brings us to the end of this conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found something useful that you can use next time you find yourself in an emergency or a crisis. Again, if you want to dig deeper into a lot of the concepts that we covered here, sign up for the Emergency Mind newsletter, Knowledge Under Pressure. It is free and it is awesome. You can join by going to www.emergencymind.com slash sign up. Also, as a reminder, our mission here at The Emergency Mind is to dig into lessons around applying knowledge under pressure, not to provide medical advice. Our opinions, as expressed on this podcast or elsewhere, are our own and not necessarily those of our employers or the hospitals at which we work. So keep up the good work, keep training, and good luck out there.